I'm going to do one thing for you. One thing I do like to see is that uh, one that uh, I think squared up. I integrated the view where I met. I met Kurt on the A, and we spent our time uh, with the audiovisual in the classroom as well as uh, other half of our time is spent with creative services and then technology half and half. So we're either integrating and putting it in place or we're um, creating media, you know, videos, and doing a lot of photography. So. I see a crooked projection screen at the top. It's like wanting to wipe someone's mouth off when you see a little bit of food coming out. Hey, I think I see some familiar faces here um, in the back. So, um, and I think it's that time of day too where everyone's in, you know, safely in the back of the room. So <laughs> you don't have to worry about too much of any silly screen or uh, ray. Well, there might be some ray foam that we'll have to see them later when we discuss them. Um, that and lighting. So I hope you look forward to that. That's kind of a lie. Do audio for me. Wait. Well, yeah, drop out there. Um. Yeah. I'm, my name's Jordan Cook. I'm with Heartland EA11. I'm a multimedia specialist. I've been there for a good number of years now. Uh, I profess to know what I'm doing. Occasionally, and then we get to, to do the jobs around that site. Uh, like I said, I work with creative services as well as um, a lot with the technology group. Um, a really great thing to be able to do too is work with the tech team people. And we have a cadre of folks, and a lot of them are here and are actually presenting. So I'm getting to do a little, of just a taste of what they do um, for their day in and day out jobs, and it's, I think it's really incredible. And it's touching the lives of you know you people, teachers integrators, uh, technology coordinators, and, and in some cases lots of interesting teacher library media, media people who are also these really, I, I think those are the really luminary people too because of all the different things you get to do. So, But hey, I'm here to talk to you about some trends, um, new products, um, special services, what I mean by that are some things that I'm seeing online that are, um, that they fit with the trends and then some good practices that falls in line with like better video practices. I might just touch on a presentation I made actually a year ago here at iTech that's all about better video in the classroom. So right now, trends for audiovisual that I've um, been researching and noticing. Um, I talked about like in this case, um, AV classroom and technology. Um, got a matrix switcher that I'd like to talk about that we have, and we're integrating that into some spaces as well as um, the cousin of that same switcher model was built by Roland and we're using that for some live uh, switching type applications. I'm um, going to talk about some large touch panel monitors, just kind of a revolution in touch panel monitors. Uh, some of which you've seen out here, a couple of those brands, um, we're not vested in all the brands that come out, we just have to, we have to like, pick something and use it, so we're using clear touch right now, but there's another uh, really interesting product right outside this room that's I thought was pretty neat. Um, um, how many of you are dealing with like distance learning, whether you like it or not? The flipped classroom, the blended learning environments started to take our old school, um, and, and this is a concept I'm kind of pointing, trying to bring it up a lot, but I've seen, seen in so many places, your new classroom model is turning into the, like, the old school distance learning model but more is expected of every teacher in every space. So technology integration is going to have to follow suit with that. So almost, at, you know, and I'll get out later, but I'll have to talk about like every room's going to get, probably have some kind of camera in it, and you're probably going to have to have a microphone, and then there will be some kind of screen capture device or web type, um, I'll say lesson planning capture. So when you deal with that, um, you'll have to think of it more as a virtual classroom for distance learning. Um, another trend too we're seeing is like lampless projection. Um, th that's a really a big revolution now. Not all projectors are, are lamp free. We still have some good heat coming off of something like this. 
but it's a good thing to think about if, if you're dealing with a new budget type idea and have any budget constraints. Um, maybe maybe you wait a year or two before you go land free with projections so the market kind of settles down. But right now it is settling down, so that's something uh, you can look forward to. I already kind of touched on the flip learning support. That ties in a little bit with the virtual classroom ideology um, or distance learning ideology. And then, like I said earlier, can some concepts to help for the better video. So, um, something we're using right here, I got a colleague back here, also who's uh, vested in the system, he actually recommended it. It's a type of a uh, switcher, and we're using it um, and part of this information I presented to some tech coordinators before too. But it allows you to have a lot of inputs in one room, and you can do some tablet control like with an iOS device and you can switch your inputs and sources. So um, the Roland XS, in this case it's an 83H, that's a three input, um, no it's an eight input, three output type device. So in an environment where we have like three projection units, you can take in all kinds of different sources, HDMI, um, and even some analog sources like uh, VGA. Right now this computer's adapted to VGA with this adapter, but um, most projectors, as you see here, you're using either a VGA or an HDMI input. That's still, VGA is still a standard, it's still being put on things, even though it's supposedly been sunsetted as a, an input. Um, just something to think about and look at there. Um, with those outputs, though, and the matrix ability, you're able to um, have a lot of functionality with, with a room and a switching system. So it's, it's one of those things where the price involved, you can deal with that and put it into like a boardroom or something else that might be of value to you. Um, this is what it looks like. So it's got just a plethora of audio inputs, all analog. It's got a plethora of um, video inputs that are the, the VGA and then your digital system inputs here too. And then it uses a uh, a T-based Ethernet type output to the projection, so that allows you to run Ethernet out to your projectors instead of any ex see rather expensive VGA or HDMI cabling. So HD-based T Ethernet is, is kind of a newer way to go. I'm not sure if this guy's got it on board, but um, it looks just like the light Ethernet connection uses the same uh, RJ45 connector. Um, the real, real cool part though is that it uses an iOS type app to let you customize a menu for your inputs and your outputs. You can even set presets on that. So, um, anyway, kudos to um, our guy David who found that here in our ADA. The big brother to that is also something used more for a live situation that can mix audio. It's also got a USB output that allows you to stream that to a soft codec. And that's the real uh, interesting part that that can be used in a school environment for sports as well as more, uh, more things uh, like uh, musicals and so forth. So you, you could gain a lot from having something like that in a school, you know, maybe shared one per building. So definitely look into that Roland DR50 and that XS83H. Um, any of the Roland series for your live audio video switching needs. This is more installation grade. This is more for live uh, situations. Now there's other switchers and also things that can allow you to um, encode like on board of one source. So let's say for instance this uh, room is having a recording happen. There could easily be a, a switcher on board of that. And I'm sorry, a little encoder device on that that's sending back a feed to a central control or just simply your computer or soft codec nearby. So that allows you to hit your favorite uh, output um, website, whether you're using a live stream or any other type of um, you know, streaming hosting type scenario. Um, another big boy here, you've heard of the TriCaster by New Tech. Um, those, those are some pretty big things there that. Uh, allow you to do that. Teradek makes some really interesting uh, products too. Um, 
and they have the VU and the QV unit that goes on board a camera as well. Okay, in trending with audiovisual, you're seeing large format displays and just getting quite a bit larger. Um, but also, the big thing is they're interactive touch panels. So here's a clear touch model, and then over here I think we have the box light that comes from in focus to making that. So uh, interactive, um, fairly durable, and then they're uh, they're on mounts that allow you to uh, articulate them for different environments. So like a tabletop type display, it'll let you use them that that light. So. Um, it's really nothing new to have a big display, but it's, it's getting newer to have them in excess of 75 inches diagonal on up. So that's, that's the new thing. They're interactive. They're replacing having projection in classrooms. So that could be, that could be something to think about if you're um, you know, in a budget scenario or considering some new AV, maybe for a certain space, a library or something. You need that interactivity. And there's lots more. I want to say there's a lot of teachers who have been continually vested in the whiteboard interactivity already. So this could be an easy swap if you need it. Most of these, what makes them special is the fact that they have um, onboard computers or uh, apps built, built on. So they might have a real small microprocessor with maybe an Android OS on it. Or and in one case, we we fortified something with a, our own computer, but it already had an Android base uh, OS on board. So you can have overlays of Android and use those apps, as well as having your own computer system running the annotative software that comes with it. All kinds of annotated software out there. Uh, for clear touch, it's called Easy Note. Um, right outside here, but uh, they do. It was interesting to see. There's a new line uh, brand X5 or X7 outside. That's a really nice monitor. You might want to consider taking a look outside there too. Um, don't forget MenQ, Mimeo makes that box light. And NEC is not out of the market. Most of the big projection brands have got some kind of version that, that's out. Um, it costs a little bit more for commercial quality stuff, but. It would hold up to date and yeah, these. Yeah. How, how did how did these things uh, compare in price with like a smart board or something? I mean, is it are they close or getting closer? Right now they're not terribly close. I mean, you're looking at four thousand dollars or more for a, a larger monitor, um, and we have a smart board that might run you for maybe a. 75 inch, I think a smart board might run about $1,200 or so. And maybe some schools are getting for around six, but um, yeah, of course, you're getting into some areas too where these are a little bit more annotative, software agnostic, where the smart is very um, locked into its own. Um, although you, you can get into some other, like Mimeo makes. Maybe it'll make some, and then there's Promethean that makes boards still, but it's a little bit more whiteboard, annotative, agnostic for software. But, well, the, the cool thing is the market's getting more developed, and the prices will come down more. So you, you can get some, or some consumer grade type touch panel things cheaper. Not much more than regular TV, but they're, they're maybe not as tough, you know, surface wise. And they, they do use different technologies. Some use the uh, some use a, a, a double film, and some are using a I forgot which one here. I think yeah. Well, some of them use a little uh, almost like a camera sensor, but it's, it's an emitter that actually picks up and triangulates. Well, it does more than triangulate. It, it figures out where your finger is on the grid. So some of those can be pretty accurate. Uh, why be interested in that? Now I'm thinking more about your time and energy going into a projector. You know the price of a projector, the price of a screen, and all that. Um, well, what you can gain out of the display now is you're going to have a lot higher amount of resolution. Um, 
And then, of course, you can get into higher technology where you're uh, dealing with OLED that displays a lot thinner. So lighter and thinner. Um, they've got their own apps. And some of them have their own computers built in. And then they give you those options of like 75 up to 102 inch. That starts competing with the projector display for sure. I want to note too, for this is a little bit out of place here on the, on the presentation, but um, other, other technology to think about too is web cameras are getting a lot better. Uh, you've got USB 3 webcams that are higher resolution if you need to integrate with a, with a screen or something. Um, and then um, some odd but really interesting product like the front row Juno speaker. There's one out here, actually downstairs in the, in the display hall where the vendors are. They, they have their own lesson capture software, and that's something to think about as they talk about some of the uh, lesson capture software coming up too. And then the hover, hover cam type vacuum camera, that, that's a pretty remarkable little unit too. They make several different models, but it's something to take a look at as well. And I think they're been represented here as well. So if you're, you're still in the market for projection, the state of Lampus projectors, um, they're getting a lot better, um, brighter, and, and they're better for color safe over a longer period of time. Some brands are LED and laser, but there are some out there that are also like full laser uh, type projections. They're coming, in a, they're coming down in price from the market way. I would take a look at the, uh, the ones I have listed, like the Casio that you see in Sony, as well as the Epson. Um, just really a remarkable price range now, too. I'm, I'm talking that uh, 600 to $1,200 mark for, for the classroom bright type projectors that you can get now. If you have any questions, let me know. But we've actually got. Uh, bought some of the Casios for our, our fleet of portables and people like those because there's thin and lightweight and they, they shut down relatively fast. So that's something to think about there. And anyway, that's some of the one that's the type that we're into. This is the kind that we have out in the fleet right now. And um, this remarkably is one that's about twenty eight hundred lumens, so thirty two hundred lumens. And that can be had for around six hundred dollars. So anyway, so some of the things we think about for our location is we have a big PD environment for teachers, so we want to make sure everything is very consistent with the AV in our area for presenting. And then we standardize lots of platforms. Um, and one of our shared ideas is that conference rooms you have simpler operation for most users because we had so many kinds of people in our doors. Um, it could be you, for instance, coming Sunday. So something, that, something to think about for uh, this virtual classroom idea is that um, every room might need to be a connected classroom and not connected in a way that we're connecting with internet now, but more connected like your, your distance learning. You're, you're, you're making sure that you've got a, a screening possibility for children that are in, in that room with the teacher at the time, either maybe at home sick or ill, or maybe you're working with a double size room and you're, you're projecting to another room. So you basically could have double the size of the, the seating capacity without being present in one room. This here is an example of two rooms. This is the University of North Carolina, but they, they just have some nice images of kind of what I'm getting at, you know, front rear projection as well as uh, a, a really good high-tech black turn type environment. That might not be the case for K-12, but it gives you the idea that you, know, you can certainly have a webcam in front and the end in the back of a room that would allow you to um, stream out. Or the next big thing is working with the teacher and their lesson capture type software. So whether it's streaming out, that's Kind of irrelevant, but there might need to be things in place that you have to think about from a technology standpoint where you could put cameras in place and microphones, and then the teachers could use different kinds of uh, lesson capture softwares to come through. So you want to go from connected to a 
you know, a virtual type environment, but um, you think of dealing with a flipped classroom and lots of elastic capture software, so um, everything I was getting at kind of is summed up in this sort of experience here. This is a real video to take a look at. Kind of what the, the future could be like for teaching and learning. Imagine a giant lava ball that's been flying for billions of years to space where it's so cold that its outer layers froze to stone. But the core remains as hot as the surface of the sun. That is our planet. Uh, can anybody tell me how old our planet is? <laughs> Take a look at, you can hunt down our Heartland Tick. 
one of the last tick sessions we had, and that's a technology fusion collaborative. One of the last ticks we had, a gal was using Ed Puzzle to great effect. And now they're actually going to be pushing some virtual reality on Ed Puzzle. So Ed Puzzle is a, like a lesson plan and a hosting service. So they also have a subscription service where you can look at other lessons that teachers have made and um, integrate that into your, your teaching platform. So um, Office Mix is a PowerPoint add-in, but that actually lets you do more um, screencasting and hosting some lesson plans as well. And Blend Space, that's, that's also a pretty interesting one too. They call it Tez Teach, but it, it changed from Blend Space to Tez Teach, and it's a, oh, let me find that one for you. I might have, here we go. Tez Teach, it, it, it allows you to uh, do a fair amount of lesson planning too. So, from a technology standpoint, what I want to get at was, yes, you got a webcam, you have a microphone, the teacher can come and use any kind of lesson or recording type software, as long as you get that in place, the, the infrastructure in place, they can come and go and, and utilize their different lesson planning and screen recording and flip type environment, uh, uh, I guess hosting service, if you will. If you get a chance to check that out, do all of you have access to my presentation here? If, if you do, I've loaded it with even more links and more pages, so um, I've cross-linked a few things too um, with, the, with the other presentations. So. Nearpod also, that's another one I was playing with as well. That's really interesting, and there's also lessons on board that that teachers can get into and integrate with their uh, their, their uh, curriculum. But hey, I'm not a curriculum specialist, so I, there's some places I don't want to go. Now I'm getting into some sharing type things. Um, you know, you can use Wondershare, YouTube. Um, you've got TeacherTube and MediaX. And then, uh, I'm not sure what your school is used for sharing. I know, you know YouTube's pretty ubiquitous, but there might be some other methods that allow people to share in house. Um, there's literally dozens of ways to do it. And there's, there are some companies too that you can look for that will host it primarily just for education and just for school, Subscri subscription based, um, like EduVision, you, you can get involved there with EduVision, they were popular a few years ago, especially with us, but um, if you have a subscription, you can have things where you, you lock it down for different curriculums. Um, and they've enhanced their, their library searchable type database as well. So, why have good class environments where you're recording? You know, you can use it for professional development, Obviously, student presentation, student engagement, heck, this is, this, these are things the kids can do, so it'll enhance that. Um, I did a big thing about better video last year that had more to do with the teachers analyzing themselves and administrators being able to analyze the teachers' behavior and, and uh, habits. And that was an interesting way to go, because that, that's kind of its own subset of video work, but, um, you know, Basically, you can have things in place that would allow that. Small group learning and collaborating. Um, you know, doing video on a smaller scale is something to think about as well. And recording, you know, multiple places in the room too. Remote broadcast streaming and big accessibility. That, that's the whole idea for um, having a virtual classroom. So, I'm offering you guys here some resources to like my old presentation and then some videos here. Um, I made this role be kind of the star last year for a technology piece and I've done some presentations before where I brought so much gear in I, I just uh, over encumbered myself and I couldn't talk all about it through the entire 50 minutes that I had. But um, I recommend Swivel as a possibility too. If you who here has heard of Swivel or used it, maybe? 
it's a certain kind of technology that lets you, um, basically it's a microphone with a track dot, and it's just a, it's a modified pan and tilt head for a camera, but it lets you capture that software with an iOS device, and I think they'll work with Android, and then you can upload that stuff to their lesson capture type hosting service, and that is one of their big, and it's not talked about as much. The Swivel's cool, but their hosting capabilities are really cool too. Because you can take video from any source and upload it at some point to the Swivel cloud, and that can be your uh, your teacher resource, so to speak, for, for using in lessons. So, in fact, they'll allow you to upload documents and do annotations, so it's kind of your complete video document lesson planning type situation for flip classroom. So I'd say very cool. And they've improved the units. They work a little bit better with other devices too. We've, we've gone as far as even, um, we've gone as far as even using them without cameras, so. Not that I want to see more video of, of me or anything, but um, we're using it primarily with the, Here's what's called a swivel. The swivel is a device, it's a camera modable infrared tracking system that also has a high quality microphone in it. It's a camera mount as well as an IRS or tablet mount system that will pan and track you in a room while recording high quality audio. And this lanyard, because the IRS specs and the swivel, swivel system, you can hit a record button and immediately starts recording on an IRS device. What that will also do is once the recording is finished, it will point up to your swivel account, put it on the cloud for you almost immediately when you're in a Wi Fi uh, rich environment. This is your microphone as well. It's an excellent audio. And uh, it's one other way that you can easily, uh, easily create a, a, a professional looking and uh, interesting video. So here we go. This is the test recording. See, the school is actually capturing me. So now I'm going to stop the cord and uh, we'll up, that will upload to the school cloud. That's the other key, key component there is you can mount another device on it. We're testing DSLRs even. They're small. Actually, the webcam is pretty slick too. So, so I wouldn't um, underestimate that. I think they'll probably come out someday with a camera, a, a whole package, a turnkey key in it that would probably let, let it stream out as well as get a camera. Kind of like solo shot, you see uh, a solo shot. I didn't put that on here because that's more from the recreational market, but that's a remarkable little tracker unit there. It's used more for people that maybe put a really good high end camera on the beach and the surfer might go out on and surf some waves and that camera keeps tracking that guy or gal out there, or even up on a mountaintop, but uh, that's also competing with some of those throw it in the air and fly around drones and follow you down a mountain while you're snowboarding, just because you're wearing, also wearing that track dot type uh, device, so. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. How do, you, how do you map the other cameras to the swivel? Because we have a swivel at, at Grant Wood, but is there like a different mount or something? They've, they've got a wedge adapter that doesn't come with the typical swivel. The swivel's made with a little slot right yeah. in, but with some other, I want to say some other different rubberized fittings for whatever, like a phone device or tablet. So they don't give you the, uh, the adapter unit that fits into the slot. It's got a small wedge. It's got two little clamps. One has a cam on it, and then you put the wedge fitting at the bottom of a, like a small camera like that, mm -hmm. and then that's your that's your quarter inch 120 adapter. Mm, okay. So yeah, you can buy that. They're they're like 17 to 18 bucks, okay. and they're not hardy. They're they're kind of a little piece of plastic, but it gives you that ability to throw a heavier camera on. Um, I wouldn't go too heavy with the cameras though. Yeah, they have a. Their servos are a little bit weird and they don't always remember their, I want to say, they don't zero well. They need to be re-zeroed like by hand when they're off. Mm -hmm. um, and I say the other, the other number one thing to think about is 
getting that, making sure you're on, a, on an absolute level of tripod for the server to work or the swivel to work, and, or use a tabletop. Okay. Never, they haven't figured out a way to grab on a, a tablet too well because you can articulate the unit so far that it'll fall off the front. So that's another benefit to using a camera. And they get used in a, we have several that are out, and they get used in a school environment to the point where they, uh, we don't recommend they use the iOS. They're not sharing an iPad just because it takes so much for the different teachers to have an account to take the video off the iPad. So if you stick a camera on that little puppy, the teachers can use their own SD card and just swap it out as they go and share the camera. So. Uh, the, uh, the software for lesson planning, so much, so much software is out there. And your school may use different things, but if you get a chance, look at our tip videos on YouTube. Our, all the, lots of different teachers have come in to do presentations, and the really cool thing there is they profile so many different things. I think you might have even been at our location at a tip. I, I can't be too sure, but um, it, it's just a really great thing to see all these people come in from different areas out of eight, at least eight, eight, eleven. Sometimes we get lucky and get people from another AA too, but it's it's just really fun. And if you get a chance to take a look at some of those videos, you can find you can find some teachers ESL, and then go to find a math teacher that is using different technology, um, or even them getting different uses out of the same kind of stuff. So, um, like uh, that like Ed Puzzle, I saw that profile twice, and the teachers were using it in really different ways. And, the reason I know this is I, I'm with the other guy. We, we have record this stuff and put it on and we get it ready for a presentation. So another a number of things I didn't cover was like gymnasium audiovisual or you know other classroom AV like speakers and ceiling. So I want to call that kind of the regular stuff, the infrastructure stuff. But if you know if you, you, you guys have questions about anything else, you can let me know. Do they have uh, speakers that just plug into already mounted projectors? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, you, you could. Yeah, it depends on what size you need. Are you talking about something you need for classroom coverage? Something that's way better than what the speaker is that's built into the projector. Tower. Oh yeah, I mean, preferably like uh, like a 360 one, like even ones that were just sort of panned out from the back of it. Without having to remount new speakers, like something that sort of uh, plugs in, attaches to the mount that's already there for the projector. Yeah, there is a. Let's see here. There's a speaker out there. I forget who makes it exactly. It's a. Um, I want to say it's Extron. Potentially. Anyway, well, I, I, I've, I've seen something like that. Yeah, it's a, uh, no, Epson's making one. Yeah. Now, you might have to remove it, but I've seen that before. Yeah, it looks like this. It actually goes in place of your drop pole, and then you put it up, and it just it just lines right into your output of your projector. So run all the regular goodies to the projector, and most most all projectors, and not all of them, they got an output. Like this guy's got an audio output. A lot of, a lot of times they're variable based on the, the volume level of the projector. So you get the benefit of nothing new for the teacher to do, just run the remote, and that can. Yeah, these, these things, oftentimes, they're, you know, one to five watt speakers on board. You, you get lucky with some of the NECs having a 20-watt speaker. Epson has been loading theirs with 10, 10 to 25-watt speakers for years. Those get pretty loud. Um, loud doesn't mean high quality. You know, you just have an open-air speaker on a box like this. But um, you, you see more baffling on something like this. Um, Extron's got one too. That's a pull mount. I used to call it Extron. Yeah, Extron has has one too, I believe. So 
But this one's a, this one's an Epson a, AP60, and you don't have to own an Epson to run it. I mean, you can you, you can use other, other things. Yeah, there's how it looks in in, in practice. Have you heard th this one? I've seen in certain classrooms too, and I I really didn't believe my eyes when I saw that one, that Astronaut CL by Seda Sound. I didn't think much of that speaker. I thought, oh, what a blinky little thing. It's smaller than a Frisbee and something here, you know. It has to have its own spot on the tile. But that would be something you could hear too. Because one, one, once I heard it, it actually sounded really well, or really good. They did a good job of sound transmission. The tweeter, the tweeter array, I mean, it, it's got enough of a baffle inside and the high frequencies. That's like a, oh, it's like a tweeter horn almost, but in a 360 array pattern, so it works pretty good. Otherwise, what we do is we just, we get some things from Dayton Audio and we drop those in on ceiling tiles. And we've been using something like a Lapai Tripath amplifier and a Class T amp. You know, we're, we're getting some of those for about 20 bucks. And, 20 to 40 bucks, and, and they have um, two or three inputs on on board, and we're just running those eight ohms to like some enclosed ceiling speakers that, that you cut in the tile. So that's probably the, that's the cheaper way, just to do the drop-ins with the with the small head. I I've, I've found it's pretty cost-effective. Um, let's see here. Yeah, these, these little amps actually go a long way. There's not a lot to them, but they sound okay. Um, we, and we, we have some larger ones too. There, there's a big, little bit larger one that's got a, actually an FM tuner built in. You, you can go that route too. For about 20 bucks, you get like a 20 watt per channel amp there. Um, I'll, I'll show you one more really quick. Yeah, we, we get this kind too. And those are nice too because you can screw them in on, on a metal level now on the back of a uh, big flat panel or something. And then secure it that way. We, I, I tried Velcroing them for a while too, but they, <laughs> over time the Velcro gives and it'll, it'll fall back. But that's, that's a decent one too. Um, in fact, it's got it's got uh, a four output, but it's actually it's actually a dual output that's been bridged. So, and then you know, take a look at um, monoprice.com or Dayton Audio through Day, um, sorry Parts Express. They're a big speaker supply catalog, and I've, I've, we've actually done 24 conference rooms in our location with that, using their stuff. So they make a nice copy of the JBL type speakers like what you got overhead here. And, um, you know, like a fraction of the cost. So. And you can get a hold of me too. I, I think my email's in here somewhere. Um. Yeah, does anyone else have any other questions based on some of the things I was touching on there? Um, what have you seen for teachers in their classroom recording audio non-swivel? Like non-swivel solutions for teachers recording their own audio in the classroom? Audio and video, but like to mic up a teacher. Yeah, okay, there, there are some mic options too. If you go with like, a, like analog mics, um, just the other day we were testing out something that was used for annotating for a hard of hearing child. They had to annotate, and, and, and the person was our, our person was challenged more with the right annotated software. 
Well, we got this uh, simple Sony uh, Bluetooth microphone, but it's not Bluetooth to like your computer. It's Bluetooth to a receiver. And then, and the more we played with it, the more we went into the little guy, the little two receiver center modules. They're the same thing. They're bi-directional send receive to the point where you can use it like a walkie-talkie. But um, one of them had a USB output. I think it can work like a USB mic on a computer. But if you use the 3.5 mini outputs, it's got it's got a headphone out as well as a microphone input. Um, but that little Sony um, microphone, in fact, it looks, it's got the same form factor as this, almost exactly, except that it's round. That was a neat option, and they were, they were running that to their um, computer, and then the annotative stuff was writing, you know, writing the words out. So. In fact, I was blown away by that. It was actually a Chromebook, and the annotative, I want to say the annotative app was. What would have to be? Doing a good job. What's that? What app did you use? I, honestly, I, I forgot. I don't know. <laughs> but it was a Chrome app that worked really, really slick. And I don't know. It, it was fun to work on with those guys. And that, that was a cheap way to do it. It's like $169 for that kit. Um, well, but I would also think if I was a teacher too, though, I, I'd get a decent, I'd spend the money on a decent uh, microphone like an MXL. Um, PZM microphone that you leave out, that, that those are good enough for a conference room and it would pick up a class discussion out to about, if your source point is your, the projector, pick them up out to where the camera is here. I'd say you know, no more than about 30 feet, but most classrooms are a little smaller than this room. And definitely the ceiling height's lower, so that'd be an option. We use a, a combination of Samson, MXL, and uh, oh, we, we've used blue microphones in the past, but they're, they're pretty affordable. Mm -hmm. But I would run an extension, US, I'm sorry, Bluetooth, or um, USB extension to a microphone, place it in a room, and then have the teacher's computer record that audio. And then if you need down the road, just be ready to have a webcam ready. So. You can, they could integrate that into their lesson capture stuff or, or use the native stuff off of the OS from the computer. So. Um, I'd go that route before you get a device. And then that way, of course, it's a web, it's, a web, it's like a USB conference mic, so you can throw it into service in other ways. Or you could spend seven eight hundred bucks and get a Sennheiser wireless kit, like an ENG kit. Those aren't bad either, but they're slightly limited at what you can do. And yeah, here is an interesting thing. Nearpod has has a, a like a live student lesson. You can get a link to it. But the neat thing about Nearpod lesson planning that gives you interactivity. I'm touching back on some of the lesson recording stuff. This gives you a, a pin that can work on an app for any student on any device. So I thought that was worth mentioning. And then it, it gives you a different uh, different link every time. So. So if you wanted to get different lessons, you, you can subscribe to this stuff, or you, you can create your own. And then there's some that are free, some that are featured, but um, it just seems like every lesson capture type uh, method that's around, there's, there's like a whole enclave of people that have subscribed to this. And, um, but that, that, that'd be great to find out, you know, a tech person's take, but the tech people that are had been teaching for years to, to find out what they thought was best. But, um, anyway, yeah, I just really wanted to cross over the effect where um, the right technology in the classroom can help the teachers facilitate all kinds of stuff like that. So, anyway, that's a, I'm, I'm open to any questions. Maybe I don't have my email up there, but I can put it up here for you.
And it's a pleasure to speak in public to you guys, and I don't often get to do that, so I don't want to lose that ability, but I uh, haven't done it in a while, so. And I, Jonathan, I know you, you do a lot. And some of you, obviously, you're all teachers and have those deep backgrounds, but thanks for listening. Um, feel free to hit that, that link. I, I can update some of the, the links, but the link to the presentation ought to be good for a while. And, um, um, I mean, I even have last year's thing in here with a lot more video stuff if you're interested. So. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, guys.